They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, June 15th. This is the TDN Writer's Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And though the run is over, I want to shout out to my beautiful young Rangers for getting all the way to, this, to the, I almost said Stanley Cup final, conference final. Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I did the podcast all five weeks during the Triple Crown. I'm gassed. It was <laughs> way too much. I'm way over tax. So I'm announcing here next year, I'm going to take at least one week off in between podcasts because nobody could possibly do this five straight weeks during the Triple Crown. Way, way, way too much. <laughs> Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And the only thing hotter than the weather in Lexington, Kentucky, is our racing stable in Canada. That's right. Top of the list. A number one. That's right. We are leading owners. We have a a 60% win percentage and a 95% in the money percentage. I've never had that before in my life. I haven't changed my underwear in three weeks. Yeah, you should quit while you're ahead. Get out of the game now. Well, and, and, and Joe, my, my grandfather used to always say to me, like, we used to go to baseball games when I was a kid, and I'd be like, wow, Greg, you know, Greg Nettles is hitting 400 in April. And he would go, just wait, read the back of his baseball card. And sure enough, every year he'd end up like at 250, 260. We were, we were literally, we had two wins in the entire first quarter of the year, two wins in the entire first quarter of the year. So even though we have all these wins right now, knock wood, we're at 18%, which is where we always are. We're always between you know 15 and 20%. So it's the back of the baseball card. It's not that we're doing anything different as much as I would love to say that it was all great management. It's just statistics. Well, those Euro horses are looking good. I, you know, a lot of those imports are looking good. And I, I said this on, on Sunday, uh, Mark Cassie's won, I think now with six straight two-year-olds at Woodbine. That's an incredible feat. Six straight two-year-olds and, and four out of his five owners up in Canada are, are, are the leading owners. I mean, it's, he's, he's having a remarkable run up there. Um, and uh, that's, that's why they call him Miss, Mr. Canada. Yep. We can't wait to see all these, those babies this summer, John. They'll all be coming in. They'll all be coming in. Anyway, thanks, guys. <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September Yearling Sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. All right, so we're going to do Belmont weekend a little bit backwards. We're going to talk about the undercard races first, and then we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back and talk about the Belmont. And, I, you know, it's not because the Belmont wasn't interesting. I think it actually ended up being really interesting with who won. I thought it was a great story. But I think, you know, there were there were so many good performances on the undercard, partic- two in particular, that they weren't being talked about first. I think they're, they're Flightline and Jack Christopher – both of those races were eye-popping races, and if you guys want to bring up some other horses, you can. But I'll start with I'll start with Flightline, and then you guys can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You know, I first of all, let me say this: just a little little you know caveat beforehand. I feel like people are are overstating a little bit the kind of trouble he had. You know, it was a five-horse field. He broke about a length slowly. He got checked slightly twice in the early going, and then he got into the two-path perfect stalking position for three quarters of the race. So it was a gr- great to see him overcome some trouble for the first time in his career. Definitely. But I do people, I don't want people to act like he had this like nightmare trip that he had to, to battle through. That being said, what an incredible animal to watch. I, you know, I can't remember a horse who looked as good as he does running and who was as fast as he is. And you know, it's, he's just one of those horses that reminds you, I think, why you love horse racing and why you love this sport and like watching these animals run because he is just so fluid and just poetry in motion, big, imposing horse who was just born to race. You know, I think there are just some horses that come around and you can just watch them run, like forget all the speed figures, forget all of his brilliance for just a second. Just watching him run visually and, and viscerally, it's an incredible experience. And I'm grateful for every single time we get to see him run. I know Bill, and I and I agree with Bill. I think it's he's going to complain that the horse is not going to run more than six times in his career. And I get that. And I'm sympathetic to that. And I, you know, I wish I would see him more often. But I don't know. Just watching him on Saturday, it was hard to be negative because it was such an incredible experience to watch him. And there were a bunch of other horses that that impressed as well. But nobody that's that's like him that I think gives you that feeling inside that like, damn, this is why I love horse racing. Go ahead, guys. 
Yeah, Joe, you, you hit the nail on the head there. And I'm not look the six times uh, in his entire career. It, it, it's you know it's unfortunate. It, it, it's but it is what it is. It's the modern era. So I'm not gonna you know I, I wish it were. I wish he would run 25 times. And if he came around 25, 30 years ago, he would have. But you know that's not anything to complain about or, or, or you know uh, to focus in on. You know, I, every time I, I get ready to punch the keyboard or to talk on the podcast about this horse. You know, I, I for something. Wait a minute, he's only run four times. Can you really say he's one of the greatest horses you've ever seen run? I say, you know what? The hell with it. Yes, yes, he is because you know because we know what he's doing. Our eyes don't deceive us. He's doing something that you see horses uh, only do once in a great while. And in some respects, you know, I don't even know who to compare him to. You talk Ghost Sapper. I think he's better than Ghost Sapper. I, I really do. Um, and you know, because he's he's running so fast, so dominant in his races. And the thing about the Met Mile that uh, I don't know if you could have taken him to another level so far as the way we thought about him. But this was and we talked to Terry Finley about it before the race. This was the first time we would really find out something about him. It wasn't just against straight three year olds in the Malibu. Um, it was against I mean, we're talking speakers, corners, beast that horse. And, you know, look what he did to him. Happy Saver is a grade one winner. The Jockey Club Gold Cup winner finished second. The only difference in the race to me was that he didn't cross the wire under that canter that he had been in his previous races. Um, you know, he was the, the comment of the race form was driving. It was not ridden out or or handling or anything like that. But that uh, I, I think as due to a couple of things. Number one, he did have trouble. And you're right. It, it wasn't terrible trouble, but he did have trouble. And he was running against much, much better horses. But he still won by uh, six lengths. He still got an astronomical buyer figure. And, yeah, you know, uh, I hope that that he continues on. And if we get only the two more races, that he continues to put on a show in these two races, then John Green can pay the $200,000 stud fee to breed his mares to him uh, starting next year. You know, Billy, you, you led right into uh, what I was going to talk about, which is what breeders are going to be looking for. And, and he checks all the boxes. I mean, he checks the eye, the eye test. Um, he's a tappet, son of tappet. He's, uh, you know, out of an Indian Charlie mare, which is, you know, very, very uh, attractive for breeders. He was a million dollar purchase um, as a yearling. So obviously he's got the looks and, and the pedigree. He's undefeated. He's won two grade ones and, he, and he's done it. Both grade ones were without Lasix. So as far as the, the breeders are concerned, um, it's check, 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 check all the, all the way through. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing that was amazing to me about Flightline is that he's done this, you know, this, this phenomenal run with big gaps in his racing career. You know, he, he went from April to September and won even more impressively the sex time, second time out. Then he went from September to December and topped that. And now he hadn't run since almost New Year's Eve. We're six months into the year and he's still undefeated and he still won that race, you know, by six easily stepping up in class and stepping up in distance every single time. So I, I think that this is a horse that you get goosebumps when you when you watch him run. And, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, West Point is a, is a friend of the show. I mean, I genuinely believe that there are certain horses in a, in a, in a crop and certainly in a generation that get you excited. And, and people can point to this race and say, well, it was a five horse field. It was. But you know what? Four out of the five horses were grade one winners. So it wasn't like this crappy group of, of claimers that, that stepped up to, to so the owners and trainers to get a free lunch that day. It was, you know, it was a legitimate grade one race. There, there were four horses in there that were a grade that were grade one material. And God bless Uriah St. Louis, because he's always in these big races. And every now and then he does he does win, you know, with like a 40 to one shot. So he got like 40 grand for shipping informative over there to, to you know, to, to basically have a published work. But he got paid for it. The other four horses were very, very legitimate. Uh, you know, you mentioned Speaker's Corner and won the Carter. Aloha West won the Breeders' Cup Sprint last year. Happy Saver, you know, who's made 800000 and won the, uh, the Jockey Club last year. I mean, these are all legitimate horses that, that in their own rights could stand at stud um, somewhere in the continental United States if, if they want to. So I, I, was, I was, you know, a believer in Flightline last time when he won the Malibu. This one really put me over the top as far as just how good he can be. And, and I can't wait for his, for his next race. And I say that, and I was like, wow, that was one of the best races I've ever seen in my life. And then I went, wait a second, that wasn't even the best race that I saw of the day. I mean, can we talk about Jack Christopher and just how impressive 
he was in a, in a hand ride all the way. I don't think Jose Ortiz moved his hands even the entire way. I mean, he just basically that horse broke, sat, went past everybody, and, and Jose was still sitting. They should, Jose Ortiz should pay Chad Brown for riding that horse that time because he really didn't do anything other than just be a passenger on, on, on a very fast ship. But guys, that was, that was like a wow, wow, wow kind of race for another undefeated horse in Jack Christopher. Yeah, well, just to go back to Flightline for a second, I, I, I just, you know, like I was saying, I, I think it was just one of those things where if you, you know, forget the buyer figure, forget even what race it was, just watch him run, watch him run, and that's that's the kind of thing that you know t- that show him show him running to people who don't get horse racing, and I feel like a lot of people will be like, holy shit, that horse is really moving, you know, and it, but it doesn't look like it because it's so easy for him, and that's. Those are the really, really special animals. You know, he, obviously he's brilliant, crazy fast, one of the fastest horses we've ever seen. But just visually, he's he's so impressive to watch. And yeah, Jack Christopher, you know, he was he was right up there. And he, he you know, Flightline got a one twelve buyer. Jack Christopher got a one oh seven. But his his acceleration in that last furlong was insanity. Like for a three year old dirt horse to pick up like that and go from like a length or two lead to a ten length win. In that short of a time span was was mind blowing. It honestly, and you know, he's he's clearly the best three year old in the country right now. You know, before earlier in the year when we were trying to figure out like who the best three year old was, we were talking ourselves into a lot of horses. There's no talking yourself into Jack Christopher. It's it's self evident how special he is, and and he does things we haven't seen yet from anybody else in his crowd. Now, does that mean he's going to be the champion at the end of the year? Not necessarily. Does it even mean he's going to be a factor in the Travers? Not necessarily. We haven't seen him go further than a one-turn mile. He's going to he's going to have to go ten furlongs to do that. But if he's anything at two turns, like he is going one turn, someone's going to have to develop significantly in the second half of the year to catch up to him because that was the kind of performance that clearly stamped. I'm the king of the hill. I'm the top dog amongst the three-year-olds, and you guys all are going to have to come catch me now. And you know, in other words, I cannot wait to see. You know, Flightline might go to the Pacific Classic next. I'm hoping he goes to the to the Whitney. Like, come on, guys, you don't you don't want to stretch him out all the way to a mile and a quarter yet, do you? You come on, just take him a mile and an eighth. That's baby steps, baby steps. So I can go see him, you know, and then and then go to a mile and a quarter in the Classic. But yeah, and Jack Christopher is going to the Haskell next, which I think makes a lot of sense. He's a you know. T- typically a speed favoring surface mile and an eighth, you know, a little bit more kind to, uh, to speed horses than the Jim Dandy and a little more, bit more of a tiring track up at Saratoga. But I- I'm assuming he's going to go Haskell Travers and then breeders cup. But yeah, I mean, tell me, tell me what three-year-old you've seen this year that matches up even close to what we saw in the Woody Stevens. Yeah. I mean, a couple points. I want to go back to flight line first. And Joe, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're all playing the game where it will he run next. And, um, you know, after the race, Sadler said, I don't know. And then Costa Saronis said, oh, wow, the Pacific Classic, which took me a little bit by surprise because, you know, the horse has gone seven furlongs Malibu, one mile um, in the Met Mile, and then the final goal would be a mile and a quarter in the Breeders' Cup Classic. You would think that the mile and eighth in the Whitney would fit right in there and you wouldn't want to go a mile and a quarter. But I'm just wondering, um, you know, he's one of those horses that's owned by like 142 different owners type of thing. Casa Sornis is a West Coast guy. Terry Finley's an East Coast guy. I don't even know how they reach this decision. Who has what kind of voting power? But, you know, if there's going to be a little bit of, um, you know, a tug of war there, the West Coast guys want to see him run at Del Mar. The East Coast guys want to see him run at Saratoga. Um, so far as playing the game, where they're going to run next, Jack Christopher, Haskell, uh, then I, Joe, no chance he goes in the Travers because, Chad Brown has Zandon and early voting pegged in for that race. And also, uh, God forbid, you can't run a horse back in four or five weeks, whatever that is, because you can't just can't do that. They'd fall apart and they'd melt. So um, my prediction is um, Haskell, Skip Travers, Pennsylvania Derby, Breeders' Cup uh, uh, Classic. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, you could take some of the conversation we just had about Flightline and just change it around to to um, uh, Jack Christie. He's kind of the three year old version of Flightline. And, and you're right, you know, when the, the NTRA poll came out, that they, they didn't have Jack Christopher on top in there for the who's the best. I was like, what are you, what are you people not paying attention here? I know he didn't win any of the Triple Crown races, but he is just he's just better than these horses and probably by quite a bit. He's a super exciting horse. I hope he holds up and I hope he, you know, is again. And, and, and this never works out because it's horse racing and we never get this lucky. 
there's no chance Flightline and Jack Christopher would meet before the Breeders' Cup Classic. Do you imagine them both being undefeated and then meeting in the Breeders' Cup Classic? Talk about worth the price of admission. But yeah, I mean, I, I've been um, been a huge fan of this horse ever since he broke his maiden. Very disappointing to see him miss the Triple Crown. But, you know, now he's got a chance to just totally make up for it. And uh, he is sensational. Yeah, no, but both of them were, were eye-opening um, and, and, you know, eye-catching kind of races. Um, and, and I also think that, that Clary Air, uh, yes. you know, ran a pretty good race in the Ogden Phipps also, which is another grade one. And, uh, you know, she had the battle for it. I mean, unlike these, these are the two Colts that we talked about. She actually really had the battle hard, um, to, to win that race. And, uh, you know, just came out of it with a, a 106 buyer, which is by far a career best for her. So she's really trending in the right direction. Uh, you know, the Kernlin out of Bernardini mayor, I mean, it, it's classically bred, um, you know, and she just keeps adding to, to her illustrious career. Um, and in the same token, as we're, we're gushing over Flightline Jack Christopher and, and Clarier, um, I, I got to say, I was disappointed with the, for the first time with the way Latruska ran. I mean, she, she threw in a, a clunker, unfortunately. And, you know, she had thrown a, a clunker in the Breeders' Cup distaff and then came back and, and won a grade three and a, and a grade one. And guys, I'm, I'm, I wonder if she's kind of at the end of her road at this point. Um, I know they brought her back as a six-year-old, which was really great for racing. Um, and, and I don't want to push the panic button, but I, I wonder if maybe her, her best races are behind her. And, and I would hate to see her kind of scuffle along and, and maybe not run to that potential that, that I remember her, um, you know, in, in such high regard. And, and the other one that, that, that I was, like, concerned about is Echo Zulu getting scratched at the gate. I mean, that, that's, that was a big story that we didn't talk about yet. Um, you know, there's the even money favorite in the acorn in a five horse field and she gets to the gate and Rosario, um, you know, uh, and, and the vets decided that she wasn't sound enough to, to run in that race. That was a huge shocker for me, at least, um, that, that she got so close and then and then didn't get to run because they go through so much scrutiny now uh, on the backstretch, you know, with vets constantly looking at the horses and state stewards constantly looking at the horses. And, and for a good reason, don't get me wrong, I don't want to get rid of that process, but it surprised me that like, Literally the 11th hour, 59th minute is when she got scratched. Um, and I guess getting scratched is better than her getting hurt potentially and, and, and ending her career, if not worse. Um, but that, that was a takeaway for me on this great card was that a couple of Phillies and mares didn't uh, live up to, to our expectations of them. Yeah, that, that was, you know, always, always want to have, you know, be better safe than sorry with that kind of thing. But yeah, that, you know, it took a lot of starch out of that race, obviously, which was basically a two horse race on paper, it became a one horse race on paper at the gate. So we hope that Echo Zulu is okay. It sounds like from the early report, she's going to have some more tests, but it sounds like from the early report, she's fine. And the shoe scratched out of an abundance of caution, which I think is overall a very good thing. You know, that last line of defense could you know, could save a horse's life or, you know, save an injury or something like that. And so, you know, shout out to, to the people at the gate who did the right thing, I think, in that case. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned Clarier. That was a terrific race. That was a terrific stretch battle. And Malathot ran the best race of her life. You know, this this is that was one of those, you know, she's one of those horses that I think it's people overrate wins a little bit. You know, she had this record, this like stellar record of all these wins, but she really hadn't run that many fast races. She was like, she was kind of one of the slowest champions I can remember, you know, because, you know, she obviously ran, ran some good races, but nothing that really knocked your socks off. I thought that was clearly the best race of her her life uh, battling Clarier in the Ogden Phipps. And yeah, Latruska, the, the pace was, was pretty quick, but I didn't think it was a good sign that she threw in the towel before search results did. You know, and search results was always going better than her on the turn. So I thought, yeah, I thought that was a pretty disappointing effort from Latruska. Hopefully she's, she's okay and she can bounce back from that. But yeah, that was definitely the worst race. Um, I've seen her run in a little bit. Uh, just a couple other uh, horses and races I wanted to mention. How about Sir Buvin in the, in the Manhattan? Just gun, gunned out to the front by Manny Franco. I hope some riders take heed of that. You know, in New York turf races, sometimes you can succeed. By actually going to the front instead of stopping on the brakes for the first half mile. Um, so he got a 108 buyer and Chad Brown. Yeah, Chad Brown had four horses in there. None were the favorite. The shortest price was Adamo at like nine to two. The other three were all double digits, and he wins the race at like 17 or 18 to one. So you just you can't beat Chad, even when it looks like on paper he doesn't have necessarily the strongest 
contingent um, that he usually has. Regal Glory uh, won the Justa game. Uh, was was super impressive, and uh, he also won the New York, which is a new grade one with Bleecker Street, who's now seven for seven. I just keep discounting her and keep throwing her out. She keeps jumping up and beating me. But I thought in those two races, the story was a little bit more who didn't show up. I thought Speak of the Devil was very disappointing in the Justin game, and I thought uh, what's her name, Rougier. Was, was pretty disappointing in the New York. I thought those were two horses that were going to run big this weekend, and they just honestly didn't really show up. Uh, Matt Araya won the Acorn after Echo Zulu scratched. Uh, Fearless won the Brooklyn for, for Mike Rapoli. It was a hell of a day for Mike Rapoli, which we're going to talk about in a second. There was a little discussion about the figures, the buyer figures in that race, because Fearless got a 95 and Mo Donegal got a 98, even though Mo Donegal, I think, ran over two seconds faster than Fearless did going a mile and a half. Um, so I, there was some discussion about that and that maybe the, the either the Belmont figure should have been higher or the Brooklyn figure should have been much lower. Um, but that's for people much smarter than me to to figure out. And it was just one horse outside of uh, Belmont I wanted to mention was Cyberknife in the Matt Wynn. There was a great battle in the Matt Wynn between Cyberknife and Howling Time. And Cyberknife's a horse that I think, you know, both of those horses might be okay, but Cyberknife's kind of under the radar, radar three-year-old who won the Arkansas Derby who could maybe factor in some of these races this summer. But, yeah, the weekend, other than the Belmont, was all about Flightline and Jack Christopher. We're blessed to see them run. And, yeah, hopefully, like Bill says, we can we can get them undefeated to the, to the final big dance of the year in the Breeders' Cup. So after this break, we're going to talk about the Belmont because it, it, it had its own storylines as well. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland September sales grads swept the top three placings in this weekend's Belmont, which is pretty impressive. Mo Donegal cost two hundred fifty thousand at Kesep and is the tenth Keeneland sales graduate to win the Belmont since two thousand six. That's a pretty good record. Five stakes winners from this year's Keeneland Spring Meet are among the horses scheduled to compete this week at the prestigious Royal Ascot meeting. Golden Pal ran in Tuesday's Group One King Stand. Fortunately, did not run great, but uh, you know he was off a little bit slow. Had to rush up there, and, and you know just maybe Europe is, isn't quite for him. But he's obviously the the best turf sprinter in America. Look forward to seeing him back here on these shores. Campanelle, who won the Giants Causeway Stakes at Keeneland, um, is going to be in Saturday's Group One Platinum Jubilee. Another Wesley Ward Stone Street Philly Ruthen, who won the Limestone Stakes last out at Keeneland, runs in Friday's Palace of Holy Root House. Am I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Some of my European listeners are going to yell at me about that. Um, also, Friday, Keeneland September sales grad and grade two Appalachian winner, Spenderella. Really looking forward to seeing her run. Daughter of Cara Conti entered in the group one coronation. And then the Palisades winner, Slipstream, will run in the group one Com- Commonwealth Cup. You know, obviously, a very exciting time to see these more and more U.S. participation over Royal Ascot. If it wasn't such a big weekend here, we probably would talk about it a little more. Um, but yeah, plenty. That's Keeneland meet. You know, it started with Wesley Ward, but I think there are a lot of trainers who are starting to use that Keeneland spring meet as a springboard to Royal Ascot with these turf horses, and it's super exciting. Um, so definitely great opportunities abound in that spring meet. Then Keeneland September coming up before you know it, and then the fall meet. So we're looking forward to those as well. So we'll be right back after this message. From Keeneland. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. A terrific maternal pedigree, grade one winners, and champions across the bay. Echo Zulu parties. Life is good. Next goal, a superstar. Go to the back. Good luck. Bites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Turkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Outstanding Belmont weekend for Ashford Sire, starting, of course, with Belmont Stakes winner Mo Donegal by Uncle Mo. We're going to talk about him, obviously, in a little bit. Mo Donegal is the second U.S. Classic winner for Uncle Mo, now has 11 grade one winners, which is an, a remarkable total, with at least one hailing from each of his seven crops 
three years old and older. That's a great nugget by Katie. That's impressive. That's an impressive level of consistency uh, for obviously a superstar stallion. And the other big winner was Woody Stevens, uh, Victor, Jack Christopher, who's now one of 11 stakes winners for Munnings already this year. Munnings is really exploding. The Coolmore Group is one of several partners in on Jack Christopher. He's going to have such an exciting year ahead of him. And yeah, really carrying the flag for Munnings. Not that Munnings needs one specific horse because his horses are running all over the place. So we did contest the Belmont Stakes on Saturday, and it was it was a great scene, honestly. And you know, we talked to Mike Rapoli a couple of weeks ago on the show. You know, he was it was before the Derby in the Oaks, and he was talking about running Nest in the Belmont. Even then, he ran her in the Belmont, and she ran a great race after stumbling at the start to be second, only second best to his Mo Donegal and Donegal Racing's. Uh, you know really progressive three-year-old cult. We talked to Jerry Crawford this week on the show of Donegal Racing, and he's obviously another great supporter of the game. So it was really nice to see two guys who have put so much money and so much effort into this game and who really care about winning these classic races, especially the Belmont and Mike Rapoli's case, get that done. As far as the actual race went, to me, what I saw was two horses who wanted to go a mile and a half and then six horses who need a bus ticket to get a mile and a half. That was my feeling. That was my takeaway. You know, we the people got an easy lead. He was who I was on. And I just never thought he looked super comfortable on the lead, even though the fractions were, were pretty tame, pressed a little bit by Skippy Longstock. And those two packed it in. And basically, Mo Donegal and Nest had it to themselves in the stretch. Mainly Mo Donegal got a typically great ride and, and great trip under Irad Ortiz Jr. You know, do I, I, I think he's probably, a, you know, a cut, slight cut below the Jack Christophers and the top, the real top three olds in, olds in the division. But he's a stayer. He wants to go a mile and a quarter and up. And so I think he's set up well for the Travers and the Breeders' Cup Classic. If he gets some pace, what would you guys think of the Belmont? Yeah, I mean, the story was in many weeks guards Rapoli. And, you know, what a good guy he is. I mean, the amount of the money he gives away to charities is just astronomical. He's this wealthy, wealthy mega is he a billionaire? Probably. I don't know the, 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 the money, but is still just this regular guy from Queens. And you, know, you can't help but root for a guy like that. And, you know, he, the joy that he that came out of that resonated with him, the, his, his feelings, you know, really put a smile on your face to see this guy win. Um, and, and then, you know, not only to win with Modonigal, but look, he took a shot. We, we talk about people don't take a shot enough in race. He took a shot with Nest. And she ran great, just like you said, Joe. Um, you know, she ran second, had a little bit of trouble. She wasn't going to beat Mo Donegal, even if she had a, a perfectly clean trip. But she ran really, really well. Um, you know, Mo Donegal is a very good horse. Uh, you know, he's one of several horses this year among the three-year-olds. It kind of fit, you can kind of all lump them together with you and I, and, and I guess John, too, thinking, you know, that they're all behind Jack Christopher. But, yeah, he set up well for the Travers, et, et cetera. And, you know, the 97, I know the buyers aren't everything, but 97 buyer doesn't get you too excited about the horse. Matter of fact, he's never broken 100, uh, never got into the triple-digit buyer number. So that's something that, you know, you can uh, take a little bit of a knock against him. And I wanted to mention this earlier when we were talking about the uh, other races. But another story that came out, out of the weekend, um, and it's, you know, an ongoing story that you uh, – and Joe, uh, John, and myself talk about it, everybody in racing. There were nine graded stakes races run at Belmont on Saturday. Seven of them were won by the top four trainers in the country in earnings. Brad Cox, Steve Asmussen, uh, Chad Brown, and Todd Pletcher. Um, the eighth race was won by Bill Mott in the Jiper. He's sixth in the country in, in earnings. And the, the, the lone holdout was John Sadler in the Met Mile. He's 19th. Uh, John Sadler's not exactly a guy with four horses at Charlestown. Uh, let's put it that way. So, you know, the, the the dominance of these guys is getting more, they're getting more dominant by the day. Um, you know, the Eric Reed story was a great story. A guy coming out of Ohio, uh, never had any horse, a horse like Rich Strike in his life. But, you know, we can see what an aberration that is. And that's not the real story. Oh, by the way, another story on, on uh, um, Belmont. Um, I mean, Rich Strike is no bum. I would never go say that. But we found out in the, in the Belmont what I think you and I, may, maybe a lot of people thought we would find out that the Derby was all about him getting this tremendous trip and a pace meltdown, and he had to have everything go his own way and all things being equal where he didn't get that kind of just super crazy good trip in the Belmont. He is what he is, a horse that's probably you know six, seven lengths inferior to the best three-year-olds uh, that, that he faced in the Belmont. 
Yeah, just to piggyback on what you were saying, Bill, I think for Rich Strike, we all agreed that it was just a shocker derby winner. Um, and he jumped up from an 84 to a 101 buyer, which is a lifetime best. Um, is he that good of a horse? I don't think so. I think circumstances showed that he was, you know, he, he got fortunate. Um, is he a thirty thousand dollar claimer, which is how they they acquired him in the first place? No, he's somewhere in the middle. But um, he he definitely didn't. I guess he didn't deserve to be eighty one to one in the Derby, and he certainly didn't deserve to be four to one in the uh, in the Belmont. Um, so the you know the, the the it just goes to show you how much uh, you know the the betting public knows or doesn't know about uh, these big races. Um, you know, I think that you guys hit on most of the major topics. You know, it was great to see um, a guy like Mike Rapoli. I mean, you got to root for him. And I don't root for too many billionaires, but he's, he's a guy that you just really, you just really, really, you know, you, you gravitate towards somebody like that because he's just like a, a normal guy. Um, he just has a, a, a lot bigger checking account than, than, than all of us. Um, but he, he just seems like a regular dude. And if it wasn't for Modonical being in the race, we'd be talking about, hey, there was a Philly that won the Belmont. Hey, this doesn't happen that often. And look how great this is. And 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 it's it, you know the, the, no shame in Nest finishing second um, in the Belmont and and was one horse away from uh, from hoisting the trophy. So you know kudos to, to that crew for opting to run both of them and have the uh, the Rapoli Pletcher uh, you know exact the box. Um, I think the other the other thing that that again just from a breeding standpoint that I want to bring up is the fact that you know Indian Charlie wasn't a stallion for his. You know, for, for for what a normal stallion would would have for his career. I mean, he, it was cut short because he died of cancer. Um, the same thing as as his racing career was cut short because of an injury. He only ran five times. Um, but you know, his genetic makeup and 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 his you know his, his skills have transcended to some of his offspring with Uncle Mo and now with Modonical and all the things that Uncle Mo has done. I mean, he's perennially one of the one of the best sires in the country, and he himself was. Uh, I believe he was two-year-old champion, right, guys? He was two-year-old champion, mm -hmm. Uncle Mo. Yeah. And then, um, and and Uncle Mo's, you know, and, and going back to Indian Charlie, and then we see Flightline is out of an Indian Charlie mare. So you know, Indian Charlie was not part of the gene pool for very long, but he made an emphatic impression on the gene pool, um, and people are clamoring for Indian Charlie in their pedigrees now, much the same as they were, you know, 10 years ago, they were clamoring for, for Tap It. And before that, they were clamoring for Stormcat. So it just goes to show you how quickly the, the, the important genes in the, in the breed can, you know, kind of come to light um, depending on where we're running or the surface we're running in and things like that. I don't want to make this into a, you know, we never should have had the 140 mare rule because it's abolished and we don't have to worry about it. But I think it just goes to show you that like, the gene pool eventually will will come to come through and come to light, and you know the good ones will continue to run, and they'll get bred to two hundred mares and and keep you know pushing it forward. But you know Indian Charlie is going to turn out to be one of these great impact sires um, with a very small pool of uh, of horses that that he produced. For sure, yeah, he's he kind of is starting to have like a little bit. Obviously, he wasn't around as long, but a little bit of that Mister Prospector type influence, where he shows up in the second dam or the dam of a lot of really good horses. You know, I the only thing I'll say about about Rich Strike is I'm pretty sure he could have run like that in the Preakness off two weeks rest. You know, they gave him five weeks <laughs> for the Belmont just to stink up the joint. But listen, you know, they got to do what they think is right for the horse, and that he'll always be a Derby winner. No one can ever take that away from him. So, you know, we'll see what he does the rest of the year. But yeah, I thought it was really fitting, honestly, in a year where we mostly talked about how the non-derby races were becoming less important to trainers. You know, everybody tried to figure out how to fix the Triple Crown. We saw a guy in Mike Rapoli who wanted nothing more than to win the Belmont, accomplish that dream. And you saw how much it meant to him, like you guys were saying, and how elated all of his family and friends were. That was such, a, such an unbelievably great you know, video and, and and reaction with all of his family and friends climbing all over him and his, his little girl, like trying to get into the, you know, it was just, it was so wholesome. And like you said, we don't, I don't typically root for billionaires in this game, but Mike Rapoli is a, is a, he, he's Mike from Queens. He's just, a, he's a guy who has stayed true to himself, who happens to be a billionaire. So that was that, that was incredible to watch. And not to mention everybody at Donegal Racing. Like I said, we talked to Jerry Crawford. It was great to see all of those partners, you know, get to enjoy that success because they're, they're, they're a, a partnership that really has a plan in place and spends a lot of money in racing. And that was 
So that was great to see those those kind of people rewarded. And how about the reaction from Irad Ortiz? He was bawling after the race, you know, when the when he was galloping out. It meant so much to him, too. So that was a really beautiful thing. And it just it was a beautiful scene, a reminder that the Belmont Stakes still mean something. You know, some people talk about like what an anachronism it is for three year olds to run 12 furlongs or race more than once every six weeks. The Triple Crown and the Belmont still mean something. And it was great to see connections who, who really, you know, in, in, you know, instinctively and inherently get that and, and you know, kind of build their their schedules around these races actually get to win them. And kind of the same thing happened in the Preakness, if you remember, because Seth Klarman is from Baltimore and he's from Maryland. He he won the Preakness. So that that meant something to him, you know, in a race that a lot of people skip because it doesn't mean enough to them. So it was nice to see connections who I thought really cared about the non-derby triple crown races win them when, when so many others didn't even care to show up. Joe, the fact that you're rooting for somebody from Queens, I think is, is a surprise. Yeah, I, to itself. <laughs> I, mean, them, I was like, yo, yeah, I think you finally put Queens on the map with this win. Congratulations. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How about did you guys, work he won the Brooklyn too. So he's, he's nice. making fun of me for that. Yeah. Go ahead, John. <laughs> did you guys see um, when they were interviewing uh, Rapoli on, on, you know, the post race when he was sitting at the box and the guy was like, Holding up the the product placement right behind yeah. him, so he could see. <laughs> that was yeah. great. I was laughing so hard about that because he was he was trying to be inconspicuous, and he was like, doo, doo, doo. "Is yeah. that the next product that Brew Paulie's going to sell to Coca Cola for eighty six billion dollars?" And maybe I'm sure, I'm sure. I just thought that was so funny, and and now there's so many memes about it, like people holding up random things behind him, like random products. <laughs> oh, I love technology. That was a great, it was great television all around. We love to see it. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Pennsylvania bred Caravel got her second graded stakes win last weekend in the Grade Three Intercontinental Stakes on Thursday, or rather Friday, excuse me. Um, five year old five year old was bred and trained by Elizabeth Merriman before she was sold at last year's Facing Tip in November sale for five hundred thousand dollars to Qatar Racing, Mark the Temple, and Madikit Stables. Also. Reminder about those PHBA upcoming two-year-old PA sired PA bred stallion series stakes. Nominations are free, but the deadline to nominate to be eligible is July 11th at Parks. So get those nominations in. Definitely giving away some good money to help boost that PA bred PA sired program. So a worthwhile endeavor. And if you have a PA bred or PA sired horse, and you know as John mentioned, there were a lot of them at the at the two-year-old sales. Relatively speaking, a lot of PA breds. Um, so definitely, if you got a new one and you like in the barn, definitely enter that rate. Those one of those races nominations are free. Like I said, so there's nothing to lose, and they're, they're giving away some good money. So we'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. The PA Horse Breeders Association introduces the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Four brand new races to be run at parks for PA sired, PA bred two-year-olds. There are two $100,000 contests on August 22nd, PA Day at the Races. September 24th, PA Derby Day has two more races, each with a $200,000 purse. The PA Stallion Series, yet another reason why Pennsylvania is the premier place to breed and race. For more, please visit pabred.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to welcome in the CEO of Donegal Racing, the co-owner of Belmont Stakes winner Mo Donegal, Jerry Crawford. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. It's been uh, an exciting time, as you can imagine. It's it's been an amazing it was an amazing weekend. You know, Mike Rapoli was joking. The co-owner was joking about how it was the biggest winner's circle probably in Belmont history. And so that's something that I don't you know, maybe not everybody knows about Donegal is that you you guys buy one group of horses every year that everybody, all the partners are invested in. I'm sure that managing such a big partnership has its challenges. But it also, on days like that, has to be really rewarding to make that many people happy. So can you talk about what an experience that was to share such a big win with so many partners? I'd be glad to. Let me start at the micro level and tell you that when we had uh, about 350 people at the Kentucky Derby, um, I I about had enough phone calls saying, hey, Jerry, can we get two double beds in our room instead of one king bed? I mean, that, you know, you develop a relationship with each partner. Right. And so, it, it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And we had over 200 at the, uh, Belmont, I think Mike had 80 some. 
Um, and yeah, he's been giving me a hard time saying he never thought he'd be partners with somebody who brought more people to the races than he did. Um, but the, the key thing about everybody owning part of every horse is that nobody ever gets disappointed. If we have a big horse in any year, and this year we have at least a couple with, uh, with Mo Donegal and with um, Ready to Perform on the grass. Um, and so everybody owns part of those two horses and they don't get left out or feel left out uh, because they bought the wrong one. So, yeah, it, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, Jerry, congratulations on a great day. And the Donegal uh, principle or guiding force or light is simple. You say to your partners every year, our goal is to win the Kentucky Derby. And you even call the partnerships the Derby Dream Stables. Could you tell us why you've, you've made that singular goal above and beyond all else and, and, and why you're so uh, uber focused on that one goal? So really, the truth of the matter is all our partners know is that our goal is to own classic distance graded stakes winners. Um, Derby Dreams is a little catchier as a, as a title. And, uh, and cer certainly we do focus on the Triple Crown. Um, it's, it's our hope that by doing that and by running classic distances, two things happen. One is that you pr produce by accident some very good turf runners. Like for example, we had Arklo who's now eight years old and still running. We had Arklo on the Derby Trail it was pretty clear that he had a turf style. We switched him over and he's won several million dollars since we did that. So you get, you get some turf runners in addition to classic distance dirt runners. There are a, wonder, a lot of wonderful sprinters. We think of a sprint as a mile and a 16th or less, um, but that's not what we're interested in. We think it's good for the breed uh, to develop classic horses and um, that's the way we approach it. Well, I just want to follow up on that. You know, I, I agree with you that I, I think it is good for the breed to focus on, on route horses. Where do you fall on, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about horses running less frequently and the triple crown possibly needing more spacing. Where do you fall on that in terms of running horses more frequently? Because there's, there's a there's a discussion about whether or not babying them more and running them only a handful of times a year weakens the breed. Where do you what, what, do, you, what do you think about that? But. You know, we, that's something we talk about uh, pretty regularly with Todd Fletcher uh, and Brad Cox, who are our two trainers. Um, and I, I would have to say that we're more in the middle. Um, you, you know, and I also, I, maybe I'm kidding myself, but I think that when I go and spend time with a horse in the stall, you get a vibe. You get an energy vibe one way or another. And Todd is obviously superb at this. And so we always say we let the horse tell us. And I'll give you a real time example. Um, our, our likely path is to run next uh, in the Travers, but maybe the horse tells us he needs a race before that. Uh, and so we'll be trying to balance those two things. When you want to culminate the year potentially in the Breeders' Cup, uh, you don't want to over race your horse uh, on that campaign. And these horses, most of the uh, three year olds have been running since they started. Uh, not many had long time offs. I mean, we had, Mo Donegal had a temperature uh, for a couple of weeks, but other than that, you know, they've been campaigning right along. And so uh, not clogging up Mo Donegal's racing calendar could be of benefit to him. And Jerry, tell us how the um, partnership with Mike Rapoli came about. Um, he bought buys in, I believe, before the Derby. Correct me if I'm wrong, if it was before the Wood Memorial. But, you know, here's a guy. He's a high profile guy, loves the game. Obviously, we saw the jubilation in him on Saturday to have won the Belmont Stakes. But um, how did this come about? And was it an easy decision to bring Mike aboard? Uh, the first thing I did when I heard of his interest was uh, I talked to Todd. Um, obviously, we're close to Todd. Mike's closer yet to Todd. Um, they've had a longer and more exclusive uh, relationship. Uh, and I just said to Todd, uh, tell me about Mike. Uh, is it, do, you, do you feel like this would be a good partnership? Because the, the, um, the financial aspects of it were very lucrative for Donegal. And I don't have to tell you, finding a way to survive financially as owners, it, it's really hard. And an opportunity for a big payday for our partners uh, was a key fact in it. Um, there's been a lot made of the fact that Mike got to wear his silks. I am simultaneously 
really pleased that we made it possible for Mike to wear his silks in his hometown and pissed off about it <laughs> because I would have loved for those to be our silks coming coming down the lane. But, you, you know, you can't have it both ways. And I have no doubt that what we did was the was the best for the partnership. Um, some of you may may or may not remember Thomas Wolfe's famous book, A Man in Full. Um, it was a, it was about a character of a, of a man who was bigger than life. And I sort of feel like that's what I've tied on to with Mike Rapoli. <laughs> you can say that again. Um, you know, one of the, one of the horses that, that carried your silks, I think to your biggest win before Saturday was keen ice in the Travers when he upset American Pharaoh. It was interesting that keen ice had a Derby winner. Obviously you were disappointed when Mo Donegal didn't win the Derby, but did you take any pride in seeing a, a son of keen ice beat you in the Derby? Yeah, I mean, you use the right word when you, I mean, we were, we were very, very proud to have been the people who picked Keen Ice at the yearling sale and then have him, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess that since we weren't second, uh, I'm, I'm glad he won um, because it certainly flatters Keen Ice, who was a very special horse and just a stunning victory when up at Saratoga, he beat uh, American Pharaoh. I, I always stop to thank the Zayats at, in any conversation like this, because they were true sports people uh, in running American Pharaoh. They didn't have to do that. Uh, and their new, the new owners didn't have to do that. But by being sporting and putting the horse in the race, it gave us a chance for one of the biggest days in the history of horse racing. Uh, and, and so I, I can't say enough about Keen Ice or the Zayats for that matter. And Bob Baffert, Mo Donegal, uh, Mo Donegal cost two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, Keen Ice one hundred and twenty. Patio Prado one hundred and five. Um, you know, you're. It seems like you guys are willing to go up into that two hundred na uh, neighborhood, but we're not seeing you buy any horses for seven figures or anything like that. So, you know, kind of what is your strategy and what is your comfort in the price uh, pricing of a horse at the yearling sales? Well, I'm sure I'd feel differently if I was a consigner, uh, but I think it's stupid to spend that much money on. <laughs> on a thoroughbred. I don't think it makes economic sense. Um, but uh, we 250 was the most we spent on any of our nine horses last year. It's more than we spent on any horse the year before that. Let me tell you, every year it gets harder and harder to buy the kind of horses we want uh, in the price point we stick to. Uh, it's, it's just very, very difficult to do that. But that, that is what we will continue to try and do. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can continue to have the same results. I know you guys, you guys use algorithms at the sales to try, you know, that is, is such a fascinating thing to me because, you know, it's one thing to use algorithm, algorithms, handicapping the races. Cause then, then I think there are a limited finite number of factors that you can put into the, into the computer. But at the sales, it seems like such a more, you know, kind of murky thing. And there are so many things that are just based on someone's eye or someone's opinion without giving away the secret sauce. How do you kind of boil all of the things that could go, go into a sale down to an algorithm? Well, th that's a question I've heard before. And you're right. You're right. It's not something we want to go into uh, ultimate detail on. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of Sheikh Mohammed, uh, who wrote an autobiography and in it he said, until you get to the point in the horse business where the person you trust to make the decisions is the person watching you shave in the morning, until you get to that point, you can't afford to be in horse racing. Uh, and, I, and I've taken that to heart. You know, if, if, if there's a bad decision or we buy a bad horse, everybody knows whose fault it is. It's mine because I'm, I'm the one who made that decision. Um, it, it certainly, uh, I'll take just a minute and tell you about how this, the algorithm came to pass. Um, about 2003 or so, my son Connor and I were talking about why we always get our asses kicked betting on the Kentucky Derby. Um, it seemed like one long shot after another would, would come along and we would be out of it. And we decided to try and find an algorithm that would help us pick a winner in the Kentucky Derby. This is way before Donegal. And so what we learned was, or what we discovered was we couldn't. We could not figure out an algorithm to pick a winner. But what we were able to do was we were able to pick horses that could not win uh, under our algorithm. And so, you know, 20 horses in the gate, 
Um, if you're picking one out of 20, you have one kind of chance. And if you're picking one out of four, let's say, you have a much better chance. And so uh, I said to my very patient wife, Linda, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, $250,000 to Lexington to the yearling sale and buy a horse that fits our algorithm. And she was cool with it. And I came to Lexington and that's September of 2008 when the stock market crashed. And when the stock market crashes, people stop buying boats and diamonds and racehorses and all the rest. And I ended up buying eight horses at that sale for $405,000 um, because of the market just, and one, one of those horses was eventual uh, stakes winner, Patty Prado, who finished third in the Kentucky Derby and fit our, our algorithm to a T. Um, and so that's sort of how we've proceeded. Um, I did worry flying home from that sale that there was going to be hell to pay when I told my wife I bought eight horses, not one. Um, but we, we got through that and uh, it's been good since. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to hit you with a, a real uh, hard journalistic probing question. <laughs> got to know what's the story with the ice cream. <laughs> oh, the story with the ice cream. Well, um, there's a there's a tremendous ice cream shop with tremendous soft serve ice cream in Saratoga. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been going to it, uh, unfortunately, far too often uh, and enjoying that ice cream. And I talked to the young owner uh, and we agreed that I would uh, make an announcement that if uh, if Keen Ice beat American Pharaoh, there would be free ice cream cones mm -hmm. for kids 14 and under on mm -hmm. Sunday. Uh, and uh, as the ice cream purveyor later said, a lot of those 14 year olds were dressed like 19 year olds. Um, <laughs> we had a, we had, I think 800 and something ice cream cones that day. And so, uh, I just thought it was so much fun, probably, probably a little easier to explain to kids in Saratoga than kids in Des Moines, why, what, what this is all about, but they, you know, the local press has been terrific. And, and so people know of, of, of what happened and, we decided we'd reprise the uh, ice cream cone from Saratoga. And so today from three to 6 p.m. in Iowa, in downtown Des Moines, uh, kids 14 and under, big kids too, um, will get free ice cream cones that are yellow and green. <laughs> um, the yellow is lemon flavor and the green, the ice cream purveyor told me is Donegal flavor. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? I have no idea, but anyway, that's the program for today. I was going to say, if, Mo if Motonical wins the Travers and you want to extend it to 35 and under, <laughs> that as well. But no, I'll get you out of here on this. You know, it's it's such a big opportunity now to have a Belmont winner, especially a son of Uncle Mo, who could potentially stand at stud. And especially, you know, if he, if he goes on and wins more grade one races the rest of the year, that's a big opportunity for expansion, I would think, for Donegal Racing. How big do you think it makes sense for you guys to get considering your business model and considering that you have all the partners in on each horse? Yeah, I don't anticipate changing it much. Um, I mean, I could make a lot more money if we uh, syndicated one horse at a time. Um, but the, but we have a, when you when you see those 200 people of ours in the winter circle at Belmont Park, and see the fun they're having and they're hugging each other and laughing and carrying on. You, you can't do that if you syndicate one horse at a time, because then maybe you have five people come to the races. I, I can tell you that the track owners, the track managers like us just the way we are. And I don't think we'll change. Well, it's great. And you're bringing a lot of people into the game and you guys are great supporters of the game. So you really honestly really deserve this victory. And, and congratulations to you and all the partners, Jerry. Thanks. I'll say one one last thing. Um, yeah. We announced after the race that we were going to give Irad Ortiz, who we think the world of, uh, a stallion share and that we're going to do that from now on. Any jockey that wins a grade one for us is going to get a stallion share of that stallion. And we hope that this will catch on. Um, we've done this with and for trainers for a long time. I think it's time we do it with and for jockeys as well. And you can expect to hear some more about that around the country. That's awesome. I saw Bill taking some notes. Bill might want to do a story on that, but that, that's, like it, yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Congratulations again, Jerry. And thanks so much for the time. Thanks. Congratulations, Jerry. Well Appreciate done. it. Appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Jerry Crawford will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. 
We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week features Defunded, who ran second in last month's Hollywood Gold Cup to There Goes Harvard. This was the first work since that start for the four-year-old geldings. The California Handicap Division starting to come around. I guarantee you, all those horses are praying and hoping that flight line goes across country to run in the Whitney because if he's in the Pacific Classic, you thought you saw some short fields on Saturday. They're going to have, have trouble getting more than three or four horses to run against Flightline um, in, in the Pacific Classic if that's where he goes. But then I also I would I would pay attention to XBTV for those Flightline workouts, assuming he's going to come back on the tab in like two, three, maybe four weeks. So definitely keep an eye on that. And for any any of the workouts you want to see for the, the summer races, obviously things are going to pick up with Saratoga just around the corner, all the two-year-olds, all, you know, so much action coming up at the Oklahoma track. Definitely check it out on XBTV.com. Okay, so we are now, what are we, two and a half weeks? How many days exactly? 18 or 17 days from the implement, implementation of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, um, at least the non-drug enforcement protocols and, and policies. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and a, a lot kind of still up in the air and some ambiguity and whether or not states are going to go along with it and whether or not everyone's going to get registered in time. So it's kind of it's a little bit of a mess. We're going to try to get Lisa Lazarus, who's the CEO of the authority. We're going to try to get her on the show before the act um, goes into effect uh, to maybe answer some of those questions. Like I said, TDN has been doing a good ser- series about answering questions um, on HISA and, and what it's going to mean for for regular horsemen. But there was some big news that broke yesterday about the Texas and the Texas Racing Commission who do not want to go along with HISA, who do not even want to work hand in hand with them, want really nothing to do with them. And as a result, they are going to, uh, or at least proposing to, I don't know if they've actually decided on this yet, Bill can fill me in, but they're going to they're, they're, they're gonna not export their uh, simulcast signal out of state, and they're also not going to import out of state simulcasting signals because you know then that would run up in 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 terms of the interstate uh ad- aspects of of HISA like they don't want to be involved in that in- interstate commerce stuff because then they think they're going to be I, I guess roped into being part of HISA that sounds like a really stupid idea to me frankly like Texas as it is as Bill me- reminded me just now has no OTBs or ADWs so they rely pretty much on that track simulcasting revenue and it seems like something to cut off your nose to spite your face that it's going to cost Texas racing a lot more than it's going to cost Haiza and especially in a state where you know they they had passed they had passed this bill recently that really bumped up the purses and made the wagering product a lot more enticing in Texas I, it just seems like the wrong decision to me and the the only you know justification i could see in the story is that they don't like the a lot of people don't like the provision that Haisa had where they could come search your offices or your homes if, if you're a horseman, which I get. I understand why you would be a little concerned about that. But I think Haisa has amended that provision, you know, because there were so, some complaints, complaints about it. John can confirm that. But yeah, what do you what do you guys think about this? Well, I, I want to back up a little bit. Um, if I had known that Hi, I was a big proponent of Haisa was on board. But if I had known that they were not going to partner with USADA, I would not have been in favor of it because to me that was the the the, the meat on the bones and, and, and what this was really all about. And the reason why I said this is because it figured to be a just a, a nightmare of implementing this because I mean there's just talk about moving parts, Joe. I mean it's 
it's you're taking a, a system that has been around for a million years and just flipping a light switch and say, now we're doing it this way. And, you know, expecting everything to run smoothly and everybody to get on board and to have no um, snafus, et cetera. And it's just it, it's too much to ask. I, I mean, I don't think I think the people that are running Heizo, like Lisa Lazarus, probably very capable and probably doing a, a good job. But it, 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 it's almost an impossibility to, to think this thing could come in without a tremendous amount of problems, a tremendous amount of, of red tape and hiccups. But back to the Texas thing, it, it strikes me as that that this is like, you know, it's my ball, I'm going to take it and go home. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that a lot of the racing commissions are upset that a lot of their authority and power is being taken away. I think there's some mentality here that you see a lot from people that tend to be in more conservative red states. We don't want the federal government telling us what to do. Um, you know, whether those are, are valid arguments or not, the solution is not to shut down Texas racing, which is what, you know, they could go ahead Without this money, I guess, but the purses would probably be, I'm just guessing, cut by 50 percent, if not more. You know, so their solution is to cripple Texas racing. You know, that just seems pe kind of petulant to me. But, you know, hopefully, um, you, you know, people will get on the same page and, 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 and you know, there'll be some sort of compromise to this. But, but maybe not, because, I mean, HISA can't, you know, just treat Texas different than every other state. And if these people have really drawn a line in the sand, um, that, you know, this is what we're going to see. Let's just hope, though, that they are an outlier and there's only one Texas out there. I hope they're not providing a blueprint for other states um, th that are intent on doing the same thing. And if you remember, these lawsuits uh, against Hyssop were a lot of them were uh, waged uh, not just by the horsemen, but by s various states, some of which don't have horse racing, which made absolutely no sense. But, you know, some of the states that did have it. So let's just hope that, that um, first of all, you know, bad job, Texas Racing Commission. This is just not serving any purpose. You're going to hurt the horsemen in Texas. You're going to hurt Texas racing. So let's hope that they, uh, you know, come to a, a different conclusion. But you know, again, um, highs and geez, it, it just, it is an accident waiting to happen. And this is a, uh, you know, one one example of that. Uh, the other thing I say is, you know, I think that the July 1 deadline was always brushed. And I think they should have given us at least another year, July 1 of 2023, before they go, they, they went into this. Um, you know, try to put this together in such a short time frame, you know, didn't look like it was going to work. And it, it, so far, we're seeing it that way. Yeah, the, the timeline, I think, is the biggest issue with, with all this, because up until February, it looks like USADA was going to be driving the bus on this and, and being the enforcer and, and the regulator of, of all the rules. Um, and we were all on, you know, definitely on board with that. But once once they got out, Bill, as you mentioned, it, it's a whole different scenario. Um, yet, you know, we got coupled with this situation and then they kept the July 1st deadline. Um, that was really, really, you know, a burden to, to try to accomplish. And I know, you know, the racetracks have been very proactive with trying to do webinars and Zoom calls and bringing, you know, mobile computers, you know, out to uh, out to the barn area to try to help trainers um, navigate through the situation and to get registered. And, that, and that's that's all good. I think New York actually leads the country right now in number of horsemen that, that have registered, um, which is wonderful. But it it. it it boggles my mind still that we're going to try to have this July 1st deadline implemented when, you know, I, I'm sure you guys are getting this, but I'm getting calls from, you know, trainers, owners asking asking me questions about HISA and, and what should we do? And, you know, should we get registered? And does this mean they can come in and do a search and seizure, you know, at, at their at their whim? No. The, Alan Foreman came on our show a couple of weeks ago and actually said that uh, that that provision has been adjusted because even, you know, the Maryland horsemen and the Florida horsemen and, and a couple of the other ones that are still holding out, we're very concerned about the search and seizure, basically, um, provision within HISA. And that has been adjusted. So um, everyone can calm down about that. They're not going to come in and knock on your knock down your door and try to find, you know, the marijuana you have stashed in your cookie jar. Don't worry, it's not going to happen. Um, besides, they don't even have the, the manpower to like, do anything, Heise doesn't have the manpower to even be able to, to keep up with all these registrations, let alone send people out to, uh, you know, to Joe Smith's, uh, you know, home in, in East, you know, Bubble, Texas, um, and, and try to see, you know, what, what illegal things they have going on there. So that's part of it. But, you know, Texas, you know, their, their stance really is, is confusing. It's almost like saying, I never want to get sick, so I'm going to shoot myself in the head. 
You know, like that, <laughs> that's basically what they're saying. They're like, we don't want, you know, we're going to die on this hill. Well, yeah. And, and racing and breathing is going to die with you because it's just not a good situation, um, you know, for it. And I know Amy Cook has been um, proactive on Twitter you know, kind of you know, knocking down and, and sending out tweets saying that none of us know what we're talking about and they have the ultimate solution and, and they're going to, you know, go down with, you know, with, with this fight. They are definitely going down with this fight. They, they, I just don't see it as working for them. And you know what, guys, we talk about this off and on, but there are too many racetracks in the country. And not that I want to see, you know, any of them go under, but it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for the horse population that, that is in Texas right now to ship out to California or ship out to New York or ship out to, you know, to, to uh, Arkansas and, and run in those races for, for bigger purses and, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe boost some of these four horse, five horse fields that we have in all these state races. So it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I'm sure there's greater minds than mine that are out there, you know, from a legal standpoint saying why they're going to do it. But I really feel it feels like it has less to do with racing and more to do with you can't tell me what to do. Yes. Yeah, no, totally. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's our red state thing, honestly. Like, it's just, it's just this, this vague idea that the government is going to come in and kick down your door and do something nefarious. And it just, it never turns out to be that way. It's just a paranoid fantasy. You know, we hear about a lot of, that's a lot of the, a lot of the reasons that people, you know, give for keeping the, you know, keeping all their guns. Like, well, what if the government tyranny, it's like, okay, the government has Harrier jets. You're going to fight them off with with your little pistol and your sawed off shotgun. Like it's just a completely ridiculous notion from 300 years ago. But that side, you know, it just makes no sense for Texas racing to, you know, this is a this is a lifeblood. Simulcasting revenue is a lifeblood for states, you know, especially a state that, you know, as Bill says, has no off track wagering and is so reliant on those other signals at the racetracks. And like I said, Texas has had positive momentum off of that bill that, that got a lot of the purses bumped. And now you're just going to completely stop that in its tracks and really reverse a lot of progress. I think that Texas racing has made from a pretty dark place and which it was like five, 10 years ago. And, you know, I, I, I get all the concerns. Like, I think this is a mess right now, frankly, guys is, is like you said, having to implement this stuff by July 1st, but also, like, I, you know, I think the, the Heisen people have done a good job answering questions, but I don't think that they've answered the fundamental question, which is, what is this for right now? Because it was it was obvious. It was self-evident what it was for when USADA was on board. Like, we have a drug problem in racing. We're going to bring in some actual cops to police this thing. And we're going to get everybody under a uniform standard in racing on drug policy. We don't have that now. What we have is just this kind of loose system that's going to come in You got, and all people know is like you got to register for it. And they're like freaking out about that provision that, you know, as John said, has has been amended, but uh, it doesn't seem to get through to people. What are we doing? Like, what are they going to come in and do specifically? Like, I guess there will be uniform, you know, whip rules and, and safety standards. And I think overall, it's a good thing to get all of that unified and, and anything that gets this industry on a level playing field across states is a good thing. But I don't think that they've done necessarily a great job communicating why this is necessary right now. They've done a lot of education about here's how you get registered, all this stuff. Not enough explanation of why we need this. And I would I would feel a lot better about all the questions and the ambiguity if we had that drug enforcement partner locked in, because right now it seems like a lot of you know disruption and confusion for really not that much reward. You know, a very kind of you know, nebulous, murky, unclear reward, at least in the short term, until we actually get the drug enforcement bit on board. And, and guys, I don't, I don't. None of us, I think, have thought of this. But what happens when you know the United States racing is all under these unified rules, and then the Europeans come in for the Breeders' Cup, and they're allowed to use other training, you know, procedures and other medications, you know, while they're still in Europe, and they come here and they still have, you know, an advantage. It's 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 almost not a even playing field then, and that's the biggest stage that we have. Um, so, it, you know, again, may, maybe it's, it's, it's not going to come to fruition, but, um, I, I would be interested to see how the European horses and the Canadian horses and the South American horses do, um, in some of these bigger races when they're shipped in directly from those, uh, those, uh, venues and countries. 
Yeah, so if you want to read more about this this kind of standoff that's happening between Texas and Haiza, and you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of other states who are reticent about joining Haiza are watching this to see what happens. Read Dan Ross's story in today's TDN. No one's covered this quite as as well as as Dan Ross. So definitely recommend reading that just to, to get yourself apprised of the situation because this this is something that's going to be very contentious, I think, in, in the next couple of weeks and maybe even the next couple of months. Uh, TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Congratulations to, to West Point Thoroughbreds and all the partners on Flightline's win in the Met Mile. That day and that race had to be, had to be uh, you know, affirmation of why you guys are in racing, why you spend the money, why you go through all the trouble, especially Terry Finley. So congratulations to Terry. All the West Point partners are looking forward to seeing all those expensive babies hit the track this summer. Obviously a lot to be excited about. Right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I wanna see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business can benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy grad, Sharp as a Tack, which is a great, great name for a son of, of, of Sharp as Tekka. Obviously, uh, I think that's another sire that could lend himself to some good names. Broke his maiden on debut this weekend at Santa Anita for Doug O'Neill on R3 Racing. Colt sold for $72,000 as a yearling. And his half sis by Jimmy Creed will sell with Legacy at this year's Keeneland September sale. So we're about a month away, a little less than a month away from that basic July sale. We've done, we've done and, and moved on from the two-year-old sales, yearling sales, just a couple of weeks away. So hit up Tommy and Wendy for all your needs. Legacy has got you covered. All right, this weekend's Remy cartoon, although how could you possibly top last weekend, last week's Remy cartoon? It was, it, you know, it had, it had some celebrities in it. And yeah, there's, I think there's a print on the way for us. Going to put that on my wall. So once again, shout out to Remy for putting us in his cartoon last week. That was a lot of fun. This week's cartoon, the trainer did say he's a stayer. That's a horse, presumably at the Belmont, who's try, who's just not, does not want to go. Jockey's pulling on him on the track. And yeah, you know, a lot of those horses probably would have been better off just sitting on the ground after they opened the gate because <laughs> they didn't want to stay. Um, so another, another, another good one from Remy. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at the world's yearling sale. Com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Jerry Crawford, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editor, editors, Anthony LaRocca, Leah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Mm-hmm.